Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Megger's special webinar series. Today's topic is line differential protection explained. My name is Michael Fleischer, and I'm the digital marketing specialist for Megger. I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation and supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter. On the right side of your screen, you will see a control panel that looks similar to this one. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing in the box highlighted in red, and I will read the questions out during the Q&A segment at the end of the webinar. Additionally, a certificate of attendance, copy of the presentation, and link to the recording of this webinar will be sent to all attendees in two business days. Our presenter today is Sudosh Cooper, Relay Applications Engineer. To assist with the question and answer session, we also have joining us Abel Gonzalez, Senior Relay Applications Engineer, Mauro Borelli, Relay Applications Engineer, Ali Hussein, Sales and Applications Engineer, and Guillermo Falquez, Applications Engineer. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks so much for joining in today, Sudosh. Thank you, Michael. And uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining for this webinar today. So uh, today's topic is, uh, you know, line differential protection. So uh, here is the uh, agenda for today's, today's uh, webinar. I'll talk about introduction, you know, go over transmission lines and the scheme classification as in different protection schemes that are that are used to protect transmission lines so the schemes classified i'll talk a little bit about the pilot schemes um, different uh, type of communication channels used and then uh, we'll delve into the line current differential protection um, the theory fundamentals and uh, different test methods and characteristics followed by i'll talk about testing aspect of line current differential uh, different test methods um, uh, used as well as we'll talk about different test considerations and you know some test challenges you could face when performing uh, uh, the testing of these protection schemes or by the conclusion okay so uh, transmission lines uh, you know it's a section in the power system which uh, transfers power between the generation and loop right? and uh, it operates at various different voltage levels. Um, the classification of transmission lines is, uh, is done in the different categories based on you know, source to line impedance ratio and also the voltage levels. So the classification on SIR uh, falls under different uh, categories, the short lines, medium lines, and long lines. Uh, we do know that power systems, they operate close to their stability limit. What it means is uh, when you see any kind of disturbance that happens in the power system, they happen in a, in a time span of less than a millisecond or, or even less, right? So uh, this calls for uh, high speed fault clearance. So protection system should be able to recognize these faults and clear them as soon as possible. Now I'll uh, talk about the scheme classification. Uh, the scheme is classified into uh, two categories. First up, uh, pilot-based schemes and non-pilot-based schemes. So um, pilot protection basically is, uh, is used to provide high-speed tripping. You know, it's a type of protection where, um, you know, a communication channel is used between multiple ends of the line instead of, uh, you know, direct wire interconnection. And usually these schemes are, uh, you know, could be digital in nature. As opposed to the non-pilot-based schemes, an example of non-pilot base would be a step distance, a conventional distance protection, right? Um, so the pilot base schemes are again classified further into the current based and direction comparison. So um, in the early, in the webinar that I presented earlier in the year, which was on the transmission line protection, I covered uh, the direction comparison based schemes, which included the permissive type scheme and the blocking schemes. Uh, wherein uh, some of them I covered were POTT, POTT, as well as the uh, directional comparison blocking and the DCUB, right? Um, those are all direction-based, um, direction comparison-based schemes. So under the current based scheme, uh, you have uh, different uh, methods that the, you know, the design engineers, really manufacturers follow, phase comparison, charge comparison, magnitude comparison, and phaser comparison. So in today's webinar, our focus would be solely on the uh, current-based uh, schemes. Okay. So uh, 
I will, I'll talk a little bit about pilot based schemes. So they are basically communication assisted schemes. Uh, what it means is that since you know there could be uh, two end line or a multi terminal line, uh, you know there'll be more than one protective relay involved in these type of schemes uh, because there are you know there are communication assisted schemes. There will be a, some kind of communication channel that is used to uh, interconnect these different protective devices in the system, so they exchange information right to validate the protection scheme. And this, these are considered fast tripping schemes uh, when you compare these with the conventional um, uh, non-communication based, based schemes. Okay, so um, next is the channel classification, you know, how the communication channels are classified. Uh, so the first one is the pilot wires. These are um, nothing but the twisted wire pairs that are usually used for transmitting, you know, 60 hertz and 50 hertz uh, signals. Next one is power line carrier. Um, I have a image here, you know, it's, it's usually easier to explain, especially the little complex things like power line carrier with the help of an image. Basically here, uh, the radio frequencies are exchanged between, uh, you know, each ends here, like from the RF transmitter receiver that you see on one end of the line, the relay, um, is transmitted over the high voltage line uh, to the other end of the other end of the line, right? So the way this works is that the radio frequency signal is connected to the high voltage line through a, a tuner and a coupling capacitor circuit, right? So the tuner is used to cancel the capacitance of the coupling capacitor unit. And what is, this does is that it ensures that a low impedance resistive path is provided for efficient transfer of uh, RF signals. And the same kind of setup is also on the, uh, on the remote end of the line. So, um, so you also see a line trap that is actually connected in the line at each each uh, terminal, basically to minimize minimize the signal loss. The next type is the audio frequency tones. These these tones could be used with uh, most type of uh, uh, communication channels like power line carrier, uh, twisted wire pairs, etc. And uh, they usually are in the range of 1,000 to 3,000 hertz. Another type of uh, communication channel is a microwave, uh, basically radio signal in the range of two and 12 gigahertz. They are transmitted, you know, uh, between terminals or transmission line just by line of sight, which means the, the communication medium in this case is basically space. So you don't need additional equipment. Um, you know, of course, it's important to account for topology of the uh, transmission path, which can affect the signal. And the last one is the digital channel, which is the popular ones with the, you know, uh, today's microprocessor based relays. Uh, examples would be optical fiber or multiplex networks. Um, next, uh, let's get into the uh, line differential protection itself. So this is one of the popular uh, type of protection that is used to protect transmission lines today. Uh, you know, line differential, as the name suggests, it's differential. It works on the principle of uh, Kirchhoff's current law, where the magnitude of the current that is flowing into the line uh, should be equal to the current flowing out of the line. So, and for this protection, right, the zone of protection is defined by the installation of this location of these CTs, uh, the current transformer, uh, and they, they are monitoring the currents on both ends of the transmission line. Right? So, in here. Uh, in this diagram, what we show is the setup of the line current differential relays. You see the 87L um, represents the differential relay on each end. Um, and then the relays are monitoring the currents from the CTs they're connected to on both ends. And then these relays are, one of them is referred to as a local relay. The other one is referred to as a remote relay. And they are interconnected with each other uh, using you know, optical fiber cables for the purpose of communication. So anytime um, a fault exists either internal to the zone of protection or external to the zone of protection, um, you know, based on the currents that are read on these relays, and these relays also exchange information as to what they see at their respective ends, um, they are going to you know, decide whether the, it has to be tripped for internal fault or, or they need to restrain for an external fault. So that is the... Uh, a basic on the line differential protection.
So uh, the really manufacturers, they, you know, they came up with different um, methodologies, different types of uh, designs to, you know, validate the differential condition on a line uh, with the help of the characteristics for differential. So here is uh, one of uh, differential characteristic that is shown from one of the popular relay manufacturer. Uh, it's, it looks pretty similar to you know how a transformer differential percentage restraint characteristic would look like. So um, what we have here is on the x-axis we have the restraint current, uh, and on for the y-axis we have the operate current, which is your uh, differential current. And then you do have a, a few lines that define the characteristic. Uh, the first line ID min is the uh, pickup, minimum pickup level. The, then comes the slope one section, and then the slope two section, right? So uh, so based on what each relay at each end, uh, what currents are being read by those relays, those currents are used for calculation. And the differential current and the restraint currents, they are calculated using these measured quantity of the actual currents. So the differential current in this case would be a vectorial sum of all the measured currents that are taken separately for each phase, right? And the restraint current is uh, you know, considered uh, the greatest of the phase current in any line N, and it's common for all the three phases. So the slope that you see here is basically uh, defined by the ratio of your uh, differential current over your uh, uh, restraint current, right? So uh, once we got the differential restraint current, you would also know what the slope percentage is. And every relay has uh, its own setting of you know, slope one and slope two, uh, if it is following this kind of a characteristic. So uh, this characteristic basically divides the, uh, this line divides the characteristic into uh, different sections. So whatever you see underneath this characteristic would be the restraint uh, region. Uh, anything that you see above this would be the operate conditionally. You also have the third area, which is uh, operate unconditionally. We'll talk about that. So the way this is designed is that, uh, so you would want to give a little bit of a leeway for a protection scheme so that they, it doesn't trip on a very minimal measurement errors or a, uh, you know, like a CT errors or things like that. So you give a little bit of a, a leeway for the protection scheme so that they don't nuisance trips on a very low, very low differential current. So you have a minimum pickup for very low differential currents, and then you give a little bit of a slope one uh, followed by slope two. So the slope two is usually uh, you know set higher than slope one so that uh, you know they can accommodate uh, high magnitude uh, for currents that could cause CT saturation condition. So whenever there is a CT saturation, we definitely do not want the differential relays to trip because of the CT saturation because it is not a true differential um, um, current in nature. So slope two is used for that particular reason. Um, you see that there is a, a, a second level of pickup here, which is uh, defined as ID min high. It's a setting value that is uh, usually used to temporarily decrease the sensitivity in situations where the line circuit is just energized. So, so that is connected to the power system at one end. So the, this particular uh, pickup level is, is temporarily increased to a level wherein, wherein the, when the line is being energized, it, you know, it decreases the sensitivity of the protection, but then they just uh, do it on a temporary basis. And then the setting is put back to the uh, original minimum pickup value. The third, third region here is the operate unconditional, which is nothing but your unrestrained limit. So uh, sometimes you would have a very, you could have a very high in magnitude internal fault. For that, uh, no matter uh, what, once the current reaches a, a value above the set point, uh, there is no other condition needed. The relays are supposed to operate pretty quick because it's a high magnitude internal fault current. And this is one of the characteristics uh, from the relay manufacturers that is used for line differential validation. Uh, this is uh, another differential characteristic uh, from another popular relay manufacturer. And, and this is uh, known as the alpha plane characteristic. So the, uh, the ratio of the phase currents, right? So you have the uh, phase currents that are uh, seen on the local relay and the remote relay. So the ratio of these phase currents uh, entering or leaving a transmission line 
is, is geometrically represented on this complex plane. And this is what constitutes the alpha plane characteristic. So you see here is the real, real part of the K factor, imaginary part of the K factor, and this is the complex plane. And the K factor is design, uh, it's defined by the local and remote uh, uh, currents and the ratio of those, basically the ratio of those currents. Now, now again, there are different uh, implementations of this alpha plane. So some of the implementations could be a straightforward ratio of these um, currents, right? The monitor measured actual values of phase currents. Um, in some some of the implementation, it could uh, it could be like uh, you know the currents are actually derived from uh, calculations that involve equations that use the real and imaginary parts of uh, a differential and a restraint current that is in fact obtained by this uh, measured current. So there could be um, multiple you know, calculations before uh, we can arrive at the, at the K factor, the alpha alpha plane plot. Uh, so, so the usage of these implementations, they vary by different relay models, uh, so they could be implemented differently, right? So going back to the uh, alpha plane characteristic itself, so this is the area of stability on the plane, which means any time, depending on the currents that are read on both ends, if the relay plots the uh, resultant K uh, inside the stability area, which means that uh, it's either a normal load condition or it's, uh, it's something external fault. It's uh, relays are not supposed to trip. They're supposed to be stable. So this is the stability area. Um, and you have the trip area, which actually defines your um, uh, internal fault, uh, internal faults on, on a line. So the, the restraint area or the stability area is defined by parameters such as the R, you know, the radius of the greater arc and you also have the another radius which is the radius of the inner arc of the alpha plane which is uh, defined by one over r and also the third parameter is the angle which is known as the blocking angle because we are in the stability mode stability area it is referred to as alpha and that angle defines this area of the stability on the plane so these are some of the important parameters um, which actually um, are are um, you know, given to us with the help of settings on the relay that define the alpha plane characteristics for a particular relay. And uh, each phase, when I say each phase, it's phase A, B, and C, they have their own alpha plane characteristic that the relay is, you know, uh, working on at the same time when it's reading those currents in the real time. Okay, uh, so next I'll talk about a few methods different methods used as well other than the uh, characteristics that we saw is a phase comparison so uh, in this particular uh, method uh, you know the communication carrier between the protective relays basically exchanges information of the phase angle of the currents that is read between each other and then it makes the decision uh, to recognize a, a fault either as an internal or external so uh, for an internal fault you know, you would expect um, the local relay and the remote relay, uh, the phase angle difference is, is zero. And for an external fault, it's the other way, but in the phase angle difference is 180 degrees uh, apart from each other. And again, this can depend on, on the way your CTs are, are installed, the polarity on the CTs uh, as well on the line. So it just depends on the implementation. The next uh, method is the charge comparison. So uh, for charge comparison, you know, the current wave of each phase is, uh, is sampled every half millisecond. So each half cycle, right, uh, the area of the half cycle is measured by integrating the samples between the zero crossings. So the, you see the zero crossings here. So the samples uh, between the zero crossings are integrated, right? And that's done for half cycle area. Um, and then this integration, gives you the ampere seconds area, uh, nothing but coulombs of charge, right? So this is converted to equivalent RMS current. So uh, there are other information like polarity and then start or stop time tags that are also stored in the memory of the relay. So anytime you know, uh, it starts, you know, uh, getting that information, the sampling and everything, it does a starting time tag and a stopping time tag for a particular half cycle. And this information is stored only if the level of current uh, exceeds a certain set point, right? 
So all this information is transferred from one end, one relay to another. And when this message is received at the remote relay, uh, it gets assigned with a receive time tag. So now uh, what it means is that the remote relay time tags and the local relay time tags, they're supposed to match with each other, to coincide with each other, right? Unless there is a communication channel delay, um, a compensation need to be um, uh, you know, uh, done for the communication channel delay. So once both the relays uh, receive all the information, uh, the local and the remote uh, relay current magnitudes are used you know, to calculate the restraint quantity and, and operating quantity. So basically, the restraint quantity is, is gotten by the, you know, performing a scalar sum, which is the uh, sum of absolute magnitudes of those currents. And then, uh, you know, the operating quantity, which is, is gotten by the performing the arithmetic sum, uh, which would be the absolute magnitude of the sum of sine magnitudes. So, so now the, here is my operate quantity and restraint quantity. And, uh, and you also have a minimum pickup level as well as uh, the bias level, which is nothing but your uh, slope, which provides security from different types of error, like I mentioned before, which could include uh, spurious currents due to you know, line charging current or, or like I said, other conditions like CT saturation that can be caused due to high magnitude external force, right? So the operating principle of charge comparison is similar to the percentage restraint differential. Uh, if you look at this characteristic, but instead of comparing the phasor quantities, the differential measurement is uh, is based on your half cycle change, right? So if uh, if it's an internal far, then both the local and remote relay half cycle charges are positive, which falls in the trip area, and if it's external far, it's vice versa. So that is uh, that is how a charge comparison uh, method works. Next, I would like to talk about uh, charging currents because uh, you know they are something uh, that's very important that needs to be considered when we are talking about line differential protection. So uh, what I have here is a pi model for a transmission line that's shown here. So uh, charging currents are, are basically uh, leakage currents. They're capacitive leakage currents on a transmission line and they exist due to the uh, inherent capacitive reactance of the conductors. Uh, so, when the charging currents they enter through the you know through the line from each end they escape through the distributed capacitance right and since the relays are are obviously monitoring the currents from both the ends they um, you know these these uh, charging currents uh, could appear as uh, you know a differential condition to the line diff relay and this can cause you know like unwanted operation even though there is no fault on the line uh, at, at this point of time right so Relay manufacturers um, they employ different compensation algorithms uh, to uh, you know compensate for this charging currents when validating for differential conditions, right? And and charging current they uh, depend on many factors like length of your line, um, voltage level, and, and many more. Okay? So some some of the uh, compensation algorithms used by the manufacturers is that you know to you know you can increase the pickup level uh you know so of the of the uh, protection function uh but you of course uh, so you don't see that issue with respect to charging current but now we are also reducing the sensitivity of the scheme right so that's one thing uh, another type of uh, compensation is that uh, a specific setting is provided in the relay to uh you know to put in a number let's say a fixed fixed amount of charging current number you put that in a setting and this is uh, subtracted uh you know when performing the validation when performing the measurements of the differential and then the validation happens. The, the third method is that uh, it's, it's a voltage-based compensation. So, you know, change in voltage over time is, is taken into consideration and relay uh, dynamically compensates for the charging current. So the way it does is that it measures the actual charging current and then it removes that from the differential in the real time. So there are dynamic compensations as well so uh, depending on the application and system, you know, appropriate one could be chosen. Next, I would like to speak about a weak in-feed condition. So weak in-feed condition is uh, basically uh, happens when there is no contribution, or let's say a very little contribution from one end of the uh, one end of the on the line, right, to the fault on the same line. So an example of uh, weak in-feed would be uh, you know, a radial line with no source at the load end, right? 
So not just this example, but depending on the system configuration during the time of war, there could be a weak impeach condition. Uh, but one thing is that the line differential protection does not get affected by this condition uh, um, in a significant way. Uh, so, you know, since line differential um, scheme trips for internal faults, and no matter the sum of currents, including the weak in feet, right, even if it's zero on from one side, uh, as long as the sum is greater than the relay setting and total fault current is above the setting, the relay is supposed to trip for the fault condition, the internal fault condition. Uh, so now, depending on the design of the protection system, right, we can feed end of the line, it may or may not trip for the fault, right? So some relays have supervision logic for this condition based on, you know, different calculations. So the calculations for this logic can depend on the local current magnitude, or it could be summation of both end currents, right? So depending on the method used, a uh, we can feed supervision logic uh, may be needed to trip the line terminal with little or no fault current. The next, uh, I would like to speak about the inline transformer uh, systems. So you could come across systems where you're seeing like there is an inline power transformer, like it's shown here, right? And uh, you see there are no separate circuit breakers that uh, you know isolates the line and the transformer if a fault occurs. So the relay has to protect both the line and the transformer, right? So, so when we when we have a transformer involved uh, in in the system, now you know a lot of things come into picture, right? A transformer vector group, uh, transformer connection type, right? Uh, if it's a delta y or a y delta, a zero sequence compensation, right? Uh, ratio uh, um, of the CTs and everything that comes into picture. So. In, in this case, when you have inline transformer, you know, the modern uh, microprocessor relays, they perform compensation of the currents. Uh, of course, considering all these factors that I just mentioned, right, they perform the compensation before they're transmitting that information to the remote end. So when you perform testing of uh, such a system, right, you would have to keep in mind um, and make sure all the compensation is provided, uh, you know, with respect to transformer connection, CT connection, and all the other um, significant attributes and then you do your injection right not only that you would also have to perform additional tests um, you know with respect to the harmonic restraint harmonic blocking since uh, transformer is involved with respect to you know, the energization of the transformer and transformer inrush so um, just uh, like in a couple of slides back we spoke about charging current even that is also still uh, needs to be considered here the charging current compensation will still be required uh, in a system like this as well. So so you have more things to uh, take care of uh, when you have inline transformer, the charging current compensation, all that. You deal with systems like this one. So uh, now let's uh, move on to the testing aspect of line uh, current differential. So end-to-end um, -end testing. So end-to-end -end testing is, uh, is you know the the test method that is uh, used to pro validate uh, you know line current differential protection. So basically, uh, what is end-to-end -end testing? And it's an evaluation of a relay protection scheme by simulating uh, fault conditions simultaneously at each end of the transmission line. So, <clears throat> so when we say it's it's testing the whole uh, protection scheme, right? So this can typically include all the protective relays that are present in the scheme. You know, there are interface equipments, There's something like an aux relay or a carrier relay. Uh, you also have the communication path or the equipment, right? Like the power line carrier or fiber optic cable, all that, all that are present. So um, this type of testing allows you to test the entire scheme as a whole, right? In its natural environment. So, so when you test them, the relays and the protection scheme with the communication, would be more closely respond as they would uh, respond under real world condition, right? <clears throat> so, and, and these can be used to um, perform testing on not just double-ended systems, uh, but also multi-ended systems. You know, you could have a three terminal uh, system, right? You, you can use end-to-end -end testing. So uh, we saw that it's a whole scheme versus individual, individual component testing. Uh, the definition that we read about end-to-end -end testing mentions that you need to inject the quantities at uh, simultaneously at the same time, which means synchronization is a, is a key word here, right? 
So this is the one of the challenging tasks is to provide the test quantities at all the line terminals in a synchronous manner, right? Um, because we are dealing with the communication-based schemes, so synchronization is, is priority here. And to be able to synchronize your test systems and the relays, you need some kind of a reference, which is your, your time sources. So time source acts as a reference here, and there are different types of these time sources and, and different types of signals that can be used, which I will uh, brief over in, in uh, next few slides, uh, that are can be used for end-to-end -end testing. So why do we do end-to-end -end testing, right? So um, you know the protection schemes have evolved over the years. The uh, the technology has evolved. So so have the test methods. So end-to-end -end testing has also been evolved. Uh, you know, and that is the only way to really validate a communication-based protection scheme as a whole um, uh, to its true nature. So uh, that's why end-to-end -end testing becomes very important, right? And uh, you can locate a lot of issues um, when you're you know performing testing of such a scheme. You know, some of the issues you can find are like, you know, you could have incorrect wiring between individual components in the, in the whole scheme. You could have, uh, you know, um, a problem with your uh, timing signals, uh, communication channel uh, delays. You could have, uh, you know, you could find some incorrect settings or, you know, have some nuisance stripping problems, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so we saw what we're going to test with the end-to-end, -end. it's communication-based schemes. Uh, you, you you know you can always uh, consider different scenarios to test like you know internal fault on the line external fault on the line right and and like we discussed uh, different uh, um, you know uh, different uh, situations where you can come coming across like charging current compensation is needed you know a lot of different scenarios you can you can involve in testing these uh, this particular scheme so uh, when should you perform end-to-end -end testing is yes, when you have any new installation of this kind of scheme you know it's it's always a good thing to perform end-to-end -end. Uh, you can do this in the maintenance testing uh, you could also do that with the breaker involved so the breaker operations are also verified with respect to the scheme um, like i said before helps a lot with troubleshooting uh, this particular scheme uh, settings on the scheme the way the scheme is designed if you modify or change a setting you can perform end-to-end -end again to validate the scheme so um, here is uh, you know a pictorial representation of uh, how end-to-end -end, um, testing looks like. So we have uh, the transmission line that is shown here, uh, we have circuit breakers that are connected on each end of the line, right? And then in their respective substations, we have the relays that are connected to trip up on these circuit breakers. So uh, one thing to note here is that these relays are uh, connected with each other using a communication channel, the fiber optic cable in this example. So for end-to-end -end testing, we have the test equipments that are connected to each relay on their respective substations. And uh, we also have GPS receivers, right? So the test sets are providing the analog quantities to the relays, but it also, it's also have a connection with the GPS receiver, which are you know, uh, getting the uh, uh, timing uh, information from the satellites for synchronization purpose. So you would see some GPS units already installed in some certain substations. Um, and because the, even the relays, they, they need to be synchronized as well with, the, with these systems. So all of them are on the same, uh, or are sync with each other, right? So this is the setup for end-to-end -end testing. Next up, uh, we'll talk about different, uh, different test, uh, tests that are possible that, that can be done. Uh, so one of them is known as the non-synchronous test, very new uh, perform injection only on the uh, on one end and you don't really perform the synchronous injection. And using this type of test uh, method, you can uh, you can check the pickup on your differential. Uh, so, you know, you don't really need, uh, need to be uh, doing a synchronous injection. Okay, and you don't really need the GPS source to do any synchronization. The second type is, of course, the synchronous test, as the name suggests, uh, synchronism is important. Um, this is nothing but your end-to-end -end setup. Um, two test equipments injecting simultaneously at, at these relays, uh, you know, either the internal fault simulation or external fault to validate the behavior of the scheme. So next we'll talk about different synchronous test methods that are used, right? So one of them is the states playback. So in the states playback, uh, you create different uh, states that indicate a particular power system condition, right? So there is a pre-fault state that is shown, uh, wherein in a pre-fault state, you will just uh, uh, 
uh, inject some analog quantities to these uh, relays, uh, you know, which will which will tell the relays that it's a normal uh, load condition on a power system, right? And then it will be there for a particular duration, that particular state, and then it moves on to a fault state. In the fault state, you would inject either to you know um, simulate a particular type of fault, you know, a three-phase fault, it's an internal fault. You would inject those values in the fault state and expect the relays to trip uh, for that particular fault. And you could, in the states playback, you could have more than um, one one state for the fault. If you are trying to, uh, you know, have a, a ramping kind of a operation that you want to perform closer to the fault uh, value, you could have multiple fault states uh, in in the states playback. And the last state would be the post fault state after the relays have tripped. So this is one of the test methods. The second test method is the uh, the DFR playback. Uh, which is uh, also known as, you know, the Comtrade playback method. Comtrade stands for the common format for transient data exchange for power systems, right? And and Comtrade files usually store the oscillography data uh, that is related to power system disturbances, right? So DFR stands for digital fault recorder, right? So here you see uh, an image of a uh, Comtrade playback file on a test, uh, from the test software perspective, right? And these concrete files are generated inside the relay anytime it uh, detects a disturbance, right? It's there's a fault, an event happens, concrete files are generated. So these files are, you know, exported from the relay and it can be played back to the relay uh, after you make certain setting changes or, or you, you know, do some correction to the scheme. You can play that particular fault back to the relay and see how the prediction scheme behaves. And these concrete files, they can be produced uh, also. Uh, with the help of some simulation softwares as well, where you can model your power system, uh, simulate certain faults, and generate some content files. So different ways of getting those content files. Uh, since we are we have been talking about end-to-end -end testing, importance of uh, synchronization, I would like to speak a little bit about the GPS receiver, uh, the timing modes, and the time signals. So the GPS system consists of uh, 24 operational satellites. Right? And at least four satellites are in view at all times from all places on the Earth. So the GPS receiver, it uh, you know tracks all the available satellites, and uh, the based on the your configuration of the receiver, you know it displays uh, detailed information on the time, the date, position, and latitude, all that information. And this is information that is used to provide accurate time signals by the receiver. So there are different timing modes. Uh, when it comes to the you know, GPS receiver, one is a static timing mode, and second is dynamic timing mode. So static timing mode uh, may be used when when you know you uh, you are in the substation and you know the information on the position and the latitude and altitude, uh, you know that information, right? And static timing mode can be used then. And this is the most common mode of operation when performing end to end, you know, on a line differential. Uh, multiple satellites are used to derive timing information in this particular mode. However, only one satellite really needs to be tracked to operate in this mode. When it comes to dynamic timing mode, uh, can be used when you uh, don't have that information of the position or altitude and latitude, right? So you go into a substation, you have no information on that, you would have to set up your antenna, uh, GPS antenna and, and have your setup ready and then you could use the dynamic timing mode. Uh, in this mode, the uh, unit continuously computes the position Right, and derives the timing information from multiple satellites. So um, those are the timing modes. Uh, next comes timing signals. So different type of time signals can be obtained from the receivers like IRIC-B signal. Uh, it's the you know, most common of the standard serial time codes and it's used to distribute uh, a precise time information to you know, all the equipments in your, in your system or the network, right? <clears throat> so, um, Basically, it encodes, you know, um, the information like, you know, the day of the year, hour, minutes, and seconds uh, in, you know, like a pulse per second serial data stream that repeats once per second. Right? And there are different uh, type of signals, even with Arik B, you can, you can have unmodulated and modulated uh, type of signals, just depending on what is required for your relay um, for synchronization. And right? you could use uh, that particular uh, time signal, uh, modulator or modulator. Next one is POP. It's called the uh, programmable pulse output. These signals are precisely timed pulses 
they are usually um, you know programmed within a resolution of 100 nanoseconds and the polarity and pulse width on these you know for the signal can be selected by you as as required by your test right <clears throat> and again within the pop there are two ways you can utilize the signal uh, one is a one shot mode and another one is a repeat shot mode so in a one shot mode only a single pop right single pulse is generated and you mention a time and date so this mode again is uh, one of the most commonly used uh, to perform your end-to-end -end testing in the repeat mode uh, again you would mention the time and date of your first pulse to be generated just like we do in one shot mode but you also mention a repeat interval uh, you know so that after the initial pulse is generated subsequent pulses will occur at that uh, specified repeat in, repeated interval right so so those are your uh, time signals uh no i'd like to talk about a uh, over, generic overview of uh, what steps need to be taken to perform the end-to-end -end testing right so um, now depending on where you're testing whether it's a laboratory uh, you know you just have your relays in there with the communication if you're in the field then you would have to make sure uh, you know you isolate your uh, scheme under test from the external circuit you know if you're setting this up in the field um, so you don't send all the you know all the signals to the entire uh, substation and then uh, the test equipment connection itself. So you would uh, make the connection between the relays and the test equipment, as well as you would have the GPS uh, GPS antenna installed and, and get the GPS uh, receiver, the unit set up to provide time signals for synchronization. And the first thing after that we do is uh, perform a meter test, right? So when you perform meter test, you know, basically inject currents and voltages on each end on the line, right? all those relays. And you ensure the magnitude and phase angles are being metered correctly on the relay. So what it what it tells you is that your wiring check is also done, right? Your wiring there is no issues with your wiring check, like you know swapping off your phases or something like that. And then you would have to choose um, what are the types of tests you're going to run. What is the test mode or test method you're going to use, right? Is it a stage playback test method, or do you have complete files handy that you're going to run a complete playback? And also, what kind of test scenarios are, uh, are being used for testing, right? Um, so you would have to uh, have all this, um, you know, ready when you have to perform this testing. Uh, next, in the next section, I'd like to concentrate uh, on testing of the alpha plane itself. Um, so I have a table that that shows us, you know, you could uh, have a non-synchronous test setup, you know, just a one relay and one test set um, in the system. When you are doing uh, just a pickup test, and then a pickup test that's performed on each phase separately, and you can do it on each end separately, right? So that is you do it non-synchronous way. For the synchronous test setup, it's that you can do. Of course, you would have to have both the relays and test sets in the in the test setup, and then now you would be performing. You can of course perform the pickup test as well using the synchronous test setup, but you would also be performing the radius test, the angle test. You can. Um, generate an internal fault right on, on anywhere on the line and perform internal fault test uh, and then by doing all this you're also validating your communication aspect of your scheme right so let's take a look at the testing uh, and these different tests <clears throat> so um, here is the alpha plane right and the settings that is associated with the plane right so we have differential this is the settings for the phase differential element okay and it's a 0.72 per unit um, and then we have the differential element radius which is at six so which means my r is at six uh, and my and this is uh, one over six right the inner arc and the outer arc and then the uh, block angle setting is at 195 degrees so here's my block angle so like i said before these parameters associate are associated with a certain settings in the relay and these settings define how these characteristics are uh, they look and they behave and they validate for the pickup test you know in this case we have the nominal current is 5 amps so my pickup value in amps would be uh, 3.6 amps in this case so um, so what you would do is you would uh, you would perform injection on you know one of the phases or you could do three phase depending on how your uh, uh, relay outputs or the trip contacts are set up for right and then you would perform a step increment of this uh, pickup value you know, you would start somewhere around 2.5 or 3 amps and slowly increment them until 3.6. Uh, 
or whenever the relay is tripping for that minimum pickup uh, level, right, for the differential condition. So that is, uh, that is your pickup test. The next we'll talk about the, uh, the radius test. Like we saw the uh, R setting was, uh, you know, like six. So we have uh, one over R as uh, 0.16 here and outer arc is six. So based on these settings, the values we have in amps is 0.8 amps and 30 amps for these arcs. So if you look at, I have uh, put in here the table where, where it shows you what are the pre fault and the fault values. Um, uh, of course, you like I said before, you can have multiple fault states, right? So in this example, on the pre-fault, this is what we inject on the local and remote. But when it goes to the fault state, it goes to the you know uh, you could you could start with fault state one, which is at 0.75, and then fault state two, which is at 0.78, and then fault state three at 0.8. So I only show one of the fault states here. I'm not showing all the fault states, but but the main idea here is to test this radius setting, right? The radius setting and the one over R, both the radius is setting. And so when I have, when I'm in the pre fault the plot on the alpha plane is somewhere here. And when, when you move to the fault state at, at turn point eight, you know, uh, it goes beyond your stability area where the relays are supposed to trip because now you're no more in the stability area as per the alpha plane, right? As per the settings. And similarly, you would, you would perform the another test, right? To, to simulate this side of, to, you know, validate this side of your plane here. And with the pre-fault and fault injection, this time 30 amps on the local. So it uh, moves towards uh, this side on the plane, right? The plot moves from the stability area on here to the trip area. So uh, so this is how we would validate the radius uh, setting on, on the alpha. So next, uh, you would need to perform an angle test, you know, to, to validate the alpha setting. So we, we know that the angle setting was 195, right? So what it means is that uh, if you divide this in two parts, basically your angle, the whole boundary, right? The alpha boundary is between minus 97.5 and plus 97.5. That is your boundary of your, your alpha angle. So you would have to perform um, you know, kind of two tests on this in the sense uh, to be able to validate the alpha angle, right? So uh, the, the first, first test would be, you, know, you would go in one direction with five angle zero and five angle 180 on local and remote, right, for the pre-fault. And then uh, you, would, uh, you would, in the fault state, like I said, multiple fault states, you could start with, it in, let's say 90 degrees, and then you, know, you would be going closer to the 97.5, and you would, you would see that the relays are supposed to trip beyond 97.5 or at 97.5. Right, so that is your uh, first result, result number one. Right, and similarly, you would perform a second test in the other direction, in the minus minus ninety seven point five direction. Right, and similarly, you would have multiple fault states, and somewhere when the fault angle is around minus ninety seven point five degrees, it the the plot on the alpha plane they go beyond your stability uh, area, wherein which means you are validating this boundary here, right? This this angle boundary. So once you get that for the, both the tests, once you get the results and you see the difference between those two angles and the difference should, should be closer to your angle setting, which means you're on both the boundary sides, the relays trip exactly where they're supposed to trip, right? With respect to your alpha setting. So let's say you got the result on first test as a 98 and uh, second test is, you know, minus um, 90 some point five or something like that then you would make, see the difference between those two. You know, the difference between those two would be somewhere around 196 or so, which relates close to the angle setting here, right? Which means we validated the angle setting on the plane. Uh, the last test would be, you know, to perform a, a, a internal fault test on the line. We do a, a pre-fault and a, and a fault, right? So you would have uh, these values at uh, 0 and 180 and the pre-fault so that they are, they are on the same direction. And then in the fault state, you change the angles on the remote relay so that now the currents are feeding into the fault on the internal fault on the line. And for, for that, again, um, you know, for the pre-fault, the point would be somewhere in this area 
And the moment uh, it shifted to the fault, it's going to go on to the positive side here, which is your trip area, right, for the internal fault. So this is your internal fault, and the relays are supposed to trip, um, you know, within a uh, cycle or less than cycle, right? That's as that's how fast they're supposed to trip for for the for the test. Now I'll talk about uh, some test challenges. So since we have been talking about you know uh, synchronization, uh, injecting quantities at the same time, uh, this is very important. If you if you come across a situation where you have um, you know one type of relay test set at one end and you have a different uh, model of uh, relay test equipment on the other end, right? So each relay test equipment, they're like you know they are they have processors. They they pro, they take time to process the signals and inject the signals as per you know the software instructions so different relay test sets can have different uh, processing time and if these two have delay between them then that could cause a problem with your synchronization of the test systems so what you could do is you can measure that delay time uh, by having this uh, setup wherein you have the gps clock that is connected to both your test equipments as well as the signal that is used to you know trigger the injection is also um, uh, sent to your oscillography, uh, the digital recorder, right? And based on, let's say you're using a POP signal from the GPS clock, right? So once the POP is generated, both the test equipments will generate your currents and voltages, and those are recorded in your uh, digital recorder, right? And once you have that information, <coughs> this is what you would see on the oscillography, where you have the uh, pulse that was used as a trigger, and based on the pulse, uh, the, the test equipment A uh, started injecting at this point on time, right? So the, here is the processing time for the uh, test equipment A. Similarly, you have a different time for the test equipment on the other side. Uh, so the difference between those two processing times is what is called as your compensation time, right? This is what needs to be compensated so that you these two test equipments can be synchronized efficiently, right? Uh, here is a comparison table of processing times between different relay test equipments uh, with some you know, real-time uh, information. So we have a Model A uh, test equipment that is like a 23.7 millisecond processing time in this table, and another model which has 380 microseconds. So uh, you know, just for the purpose of comparison, we chose different models, and you see the difference. One is in milliseconds and microseconds. So obviously the Model B is faster, which means model B is supposed to be delayed uh, so that you can synchronize these two uh, equipment, right? And that's supposed to be delayed by this amount of time, 23.32 milliseconds. Of course, if you use uh, same type of test equipment, uh, the same models, you don't really have any delay, uh, both are same, so no delay compensation is required, right? And once you know uh, what is the delay that you need, that needs to be compensated for the faster test equipment, you can simply uh, use the you know the screen on the test software to put that additional time uh, to delay that 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 test equipment on a particular end, either on the you know your uh, POP time or your IRP time here. You have different options to do that. Uh, now let me talk about uh, you know consideration for testing and some challenges, right? So um, you can let's say your relays need uh, breaker status as your inputs. You can always use the breaker simulators from the test equipments, uh, always handy instead of uh, you know having the actual connection made to the breaker unless you can have that. Uh, for the consideration of test itself, you know you could uh, consider having faults at different location on the line. Uh, of course, everything is an internal fault uh, within the zone of protection, but how would the protection behave if it's a closing fault, right? At, at, uh, maybe at 5% or 95%, just close to one of the uh, CTs or the relays. And you also have a 50% on the line fault. Uh, you can also consider different scenarios uh, for different fault types, actually, like a three-phase fault or a face-to-face -face and line-to-ground fault. Uh, the reason I bring this up is that, uh, you know, we spoke about alpha plane characteristic. Uh, in that particular, you know, uh, not just that particular relay, but different relay manufacturers, they have separate settings that are meant for the phase differential, negative sequence line differential, and, and you know, zero sequence line differential. So uh, different types of faults are also important to be considered, um, you know, for simulation 
and performing testing of the scheme. You know, maybe uh, consider a break or failure, um, um, you know, scenario at at one end and one of the ends. So, what are some of the common reasons for for the tests to fail? Is that you know you could have like uh, we discussed already, is a time delay between both ends. Um, you know, you could have uh, communication uh, not properly set up, or you know, the test equipment's not properly synchronized. You could you could not have a RGB signal at all to the relays. Uh, I mean the accurate, accurate RQ signals. And uh, since we talk about end-to-end -end testing, you know, different substations are involved here, multiple people working on, um, uh, you know, this particular kind of testing. So you could have a scenario where a one end you could be injecting incorrect value, um, you know, and it's compared to the what was expected to be injected. So that concludes the uh, testing portion. Uh, here I have uh, some SMRT relay test products that I've uh, shown here. It's the SMRT1, it's a single phase test equipment, but can be uh, multiple single phase test equipments can be used to make a three phase test equipment. We will also have uh, a three phase SMRT46 uh, and also SMRT410, which is uh, more number of channels, currents and voltages. So uh, all these you know, equipments can be used for uh, your line differential testing. Maker also makes the MGTR2, the MGTR GPS timing reference. Um, you know, it's uh, easily programmable and, and provides you the signals, like we discussed, the RGB signal, the POP signal, and all these are configurable as per the test requirements. Okay, uh, so here's the conclusion part of the presentation. So we discussed about, uh, you know, the, the Scheme classification, you know, pilot schemes and the non-pilot, how they're classified. We uh, discussed about the uh, fundamentals on the line differential protection. Uh, what are the different methods that are employed by designers, really manufacturers to uh, detect differential condition on a line, right? And different type of characteristics that are designed, right? Um, we discussed about end-to-end -end testing. Uh, you know, what, when do we do end-to-end -end testing? What are the important factors that need to be considered? And then we uh, you know, discussed how to perform the actual testing of uh, you know, alpha plane characteristic. Different tests were discussed today, and also the challenges. Like right? um, could have a you know, time delay between two relay test equipments, uh, communication uh, between relays, and uh, test values and test scenarios that are set up for testing. Lastly, I'd like to say you know uh, knowledge of, of these protection schemes and uh, test methods and and you know. Field experience definitely helps all of us you know, perform this testing more efficiently in the field. Uh, that concludes my presentation. All right, thanks, Agosh. Uh, I'll take it from here. Uh, we'll jump into our Q&A segment here in just a moment. But uh, I'd like to remind everyone, if you do have questions for that segment, please throw them now into the Q&A box on the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, for those of you that are leaving, when you close the webinar window, a survey should pop up on your screen. We would greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback so we can continue to improve upon our future webinars. On the survey, there's a field where you can also request a quote or a demo on any maker products. A copy of the presentation, certificate of attendance, and a link to the video recording of the webinar will be emailed to everyone in about two business days. You can also view video recordings of previous webinars as well as register for upcoming webinars on our website at us.megar.com slash webinars and register for our next webinar on Friday, August 20th, titled Primary Current Injection Applications for Low Voltage Circuit Breakers, Reclosers, Sectionalizers, and CTs. All right, now let's get into your questions. The first one I have, I will send over to Abel Gonzalez. Abel, how is fault location calculated in line current differential method? Hi, thanks, Mike. That's a that's a very good question. It's interesting because um, the the line differential protection itself doesn't care about the actual location of the fault on the line. The line differential protection only cares about whether the fault happened inside or outside of the protected zone, and it does that by a variety of methods that have to do with the uh, ratio of the currents or whether the current on one end is higher than the current on the other and the angles between the currents and whatnot. 
And one of the, the, the methods that uh, has been used to locate faults. Now, lo locating faults means knowing where the fault happened along the line. Let's say you have a 100 kilometer line or 100 mile line, uh, depending on where you are. And, and what you want to know is, is, did this fault happen, I don't know, 60 miles down the, the road? And, uh, and for that, there is a variety of methods that it can be basically differentiated between the the, the single-ended um, methods, which use information from only one end of the line, and the multi-ended methods, which use information from multiple uh, ends of the of the line. Right now, uh, the single-ended methods are used mostly for um, distance protection relays that act alone and they used voltage and current on one end of the line and uh, using that information of the voltage and the currents, it just uh, measures how the, the impedance and it uses a ratio of the uh, impedance calculated to the point of the fault with a lot of you know nuances in the, in the methods that we have discussed in other webinars and, uh, and whatnot. But the beauty of uh, line differential uh, protection is that it uses information from both ends of the line. And what that means is that you have um, a, a relay on each end of the line from which you can get a much more accurate uh, value of the, um, the, 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 the location of the fault along the line because you have information of voltages and currents on one end, of voltages and currents on the other. And let's say, let's just talk about a two-ended uh, line for, for the moment and for the purposes of this question. So basically when you have a line differential uh, element and you have it working on a two-ended line, you can use a two-ended um, location method, which is much more accurate and it provides uh, way better results than using information from a single-ended uh, method for the location of the, of the fault, all right? Thanks, Bill. Okay. Uh, over to uh, Ali Hussein. Ali, which type of differential element characteristic is better alpha plane or percent differential? Uh, thank you, Michael, for that question. Uh, so basically, you can consider them as a two different point of views for applying uh, line differential restraint. Uh, each will have its own advantages, disadvantages, weaknesses, strengths. So it really depends, I would say, on your needs and your capabilities of applying these uh, uh, ways or methods uh, that could say one is better over the other. But what I would suggest is applying both uh, uh, together could help you. Each one covers the weaknesses of the uh, other. Now, some of them, uh, uh, for example, the alpha plane could be a little bit more difficult to handle comparing with the uh, more conventional uh, percentage differential. So each one, as I mentioned, have its own advantages and uh, disadvantages. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. Uh, over to Mauro Borelli. Uh, Mauro, how much does poor synchronization of test signals affect the test results for this protection element? Yes, uh, uh, thanks so much uh, for the question. Uh, actually, uh, a poor synchronization uh, of the um, uh, test signal uh, will introduce a, a phase angle shift between the current which is injected in one side with respect to the current which is injected on the other side. Uh, and now consider that uh, if you have a um, some delay, uh, let's, let's say at uh, 60, uh, 60 years, about four milliseconds uh, um, synchronization, uh, bad synchronization will generate a 90 degrees of a phase shift between the two, uh, um, uh, the two currents. So even one millisecond will generate a very big difference in, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a differential current uh, which is unwanted because we want to generate one car, one amp and one amp on, uh, on the two sides and we want uh, a, a zero differential for instance and we get uh, we get uh, 
um, an unwanted differential due to the poor synchronization. So uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the higher uh, um, uh, the synchronization, the better. And this is why we're using a very accurate GPS to synchronize the injection of the two ends. Uh, so it's definitely, so we need to be very, very well synchronized if we want to perform a, a proper uh, line differential testing. Uh, that's all. Right, thanks, Mauro. Uh, back over to our presenter, Sugosh Gruber. Uh, Sugosh, can you implement the 87L using sampled values? Can you have sampled values only on one of the ends and regular CT on the other? Uh, thank you, Michael, for the question. This is a very good question, interesting one. Um, I would say in a realistic sense, yes, this is a, this is a possibility you can implement 87L using sample values. Uh, so basically, the from the question, you know, you can say that this is a hybrid kind of uh, implementation uh, where you're, you're, you're wanting sample values on one end and uh, a regular uh, CT on the other, right? So to achieve an implementation like that, uh, basically, you know, um, uh, three of the, uh, you know, from one test set, you would be injecting like, you know, three analog currents uh, straight into the relay as if it was like, you know, a straightforward CT connection, right? The second set of the second test equipment would be, um, you know, injecting these analog currents to the merging unit. So, which is, you know, uh, of course, synchronized to the relay. All these test systems as well have to be synchronized, uh, you know, with the uh, IEEE 1588 uh, PTP, the precision time protocol. Um, and then, you know, that, that is how you could uh, implement, you know, the test setup on this. Even the protection itself can be implemented this way. Um, so, so yeah, it's a possibility. Thank you, Sagosh. Um, back over to Abel. Abel, how does CT saturation affect the operation of line differential elements? Hi, thanks, Mike. Uh, well, CT when when you have when the CT saturates in the protection system, uh, basically what you have is the wrong image of the primary current on the secondary uh, of the of the CT, which means that the relay that's using that secondary value to estimate or to provide a, a current measurement is going to have uh, there to provide wrong measurements in both the magnitude and the phase angle. So since both the magnitude and the phase angle of the current um, are affected by the saturation of the, of the CT, then uh, we're going to have problems because um, now, uh, let's say the fault happened outside of the protected zone. If uh, ideally you would have uh, the same uh, current going in as the current that's going out or very similar in the alpha plane, for example, that would map to a point of uh, value of one or around there. And uh, in the differential, in the percent differential that it, that means that you are very low on the differential current or zero on the differential current. But if you have a wrong value of current um, on one of the ends, that means that first you're going to have a differential value that is actually a false differential value. Uh, and that affects the percent differential. And uh, if, if you're talking about the alpha plane, then you are going to be away from uh, the value of uh, one, which is the ratio of the local, uh, the remote and local uh, currents, right? And also the fact that the, not only the magnitude, but the angle is affected. That means that in the alpha plane, you are in the wrong place in the plane. Remember that the location of the differential currents um, in the alpha plane is actually not only the related to the magnitude, but also to the phase angle between the currents on one end and the other. It's basically the differencing angle between the remote and the local and the local currents. And uh, if you are in the using the percent differential, then you are going to have a, uh, a vector difference or a vector zoom that is uh, it's going to be wrong, both because the phase is wrong and the, um, the angle is wrong. So 
uh, the, the CT saturation affects for both external and internal faults and for all types of, of faults and uh, protection schemes have to be able and protection algorithms have to be able to deal with those uh, with the problems that CT saturation brings into the into the mix. Uh, the line uh, the using percent differential for example what you do is you increase the for example the slope uh, you use a two slope or you use an adaptive uh, method which when it detects that you have a fault outside of the of the line or when it detects CT saturation which can also be detected then you change the slope you adapt your algorithm to have a higher slope and therefore have a higher restraint the problem with that is that you affect the sensitivity of the um, of the protection scheme so what I'm trying to say is that there are different methods that you can use to deal with the, the, the CT saturation or the, the, the effects of CT saturation on the line differential scheme. Um, over to Ali, uh, can you synchronize the test sets using PTP? Okay, so uh, PTP for who doesn't know what does it mean, uh, he's referring to the precision time protocol. Uh, a protocol that it is similar to the IRIC-B introduced by the IEEE 1588. Basically, it's uh, distributing the time signals uh, that you get from the time clock or the time source uh, using network uh, uh, method, using Ethernet networks. Uh, and usually these BTB signals uh, need to have special network switches to be able to pass through them without having any additional delays uh, 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 to these uh, signals. So BTB, yes, it can be used to synchronize test equipment. It has the, uh, the right amount of precision. After all, it's called precision time protocol. Uh, uh, to be tested using uh, during end-to-end -end testing, and it will give you a very good result, similar to the IRIC-B method or the uh, uh, POP synchronization method. Uh, but uh, make sure that the test equipment that you are using to uh, 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 or synchronizing using BTB is supporting this uh, feature, supporting the BTB synchronization. And if it does not support that, uh, you still can also use a converter that will convert from a BTB to a different uh, time standard uh, that the test equipment will uh, accept. So, for example, from BTB to IRIC-B converter can be used to uh, synchronize uh, uh, the test equipment as well. Thanks, Ali. Um, back over to Abel. Which other factors affect the line differential operation? Okay. Um, well, the first one, yeah, we, we already talked about the CT saturation, which is one of the factors that affect the, the line differential. Other um, things that affect the, the line differential, for example, is the, the presence of single lane, single line to ground faults, for instance, uh, because of the fact that when you have a transmission line, the single line to fault, uh, I'm sorry, the single line to ground fault typically has, uh, and the, the issue of the return path of the current, which could be a high resistivity uh, path, uh, or you could have the presence of an arc, or things like that, that, that are going to, you know, change the behavior of the um, of the line differential um, element and they're going to affect in, in in many different ways and and you have to deal with that uh, by using a combination of the phase uh, element the uh, zero sequence element and the negative sequence element and com typically a combination of those is uh, is used to include to in, in improve the uh, dependability of those of these uh, of these systems. The thing is that when you have a single line to ground fault, typically the the uh, the, the fault current uh, may not be as high as uh, the, the 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 required current to trip the uh, the line. 
Uh, but it, that's still, but it's still, you know, uh, when you have a single line to ground fault, you still have a, a safety issue. So you still have to deal with that fault. Uh, and therefore you have to be able to identify those, those faults and trip to them uh, properly. Uh, another uh, issue that affects these, um, these systems is, and, and let's remember that nowadays when we are talking about line differential, uh, implementations. We are typically talking about a relay that's split in two. You have one relay in each end of the, I mean, you have um, one relay in each end of the line, and they typically communicate using uh, communication channels. Uh, some of those communication channels uh, that are used to uh, communicate the, the relays on both ends of the line do not have a a, a high bandwidth and the amount of information that you need to share between uh, the relays is considerable and therefore uh, relay manufacturers have come up with uh, you know solutions to reduce the amount of information that's exchanged between the different uh, points of the of the line but even then uh, in some cases the bandwidth is uh, is a restriction now when you have fiber optic systems and you have higher uh, bandwidth, then what happens is that then you're cursed with the fact that if you have more bandwidth and you are going to use more bandwidth and you're going to design your algorithms to use more bandwidth and that at some point you're still going to come up short in terms of bandwidth no matter how much uh, bandwidth you have. Another problem that you have is misalignment between the currents on both ends of the line. Now we've talked about synchronization. Zugosh so talked at length about synchronization between the test sets on both ends of the line and how that affects when we're doing testing. But synchronization is paramount when the actual relays are operating. You need to have a proper uh, synchronization and alignment between the samples of the currents taken on both ends of the line or, or you are going to end up with a, uh, a misoperation when there is no reason for it simply because the samples at, uh, at both ends differ by, I don't know, a few degrees, and then you're going to have a differential current that's uh, uh, bogus, uh, right? Another issue that affects, and Tugosh talked about it uh, a little bit, is the charging currents of the uh, of the lines, which, especially when the line is uh, energized, could be a, a significant amount of uh, of current. It's similar, although not exactly like the uh, inverse current that you have on uh, on transformers. In one case, you're talking about a magnetic. This is a capacitive um, effect, but it's also something that you need to deal with when you're, uh, and it also affects the, the operation of the line differential current. Okay. Thank you. Uh, once more over to Sagosh. Uh, do the two tests, do the two sets of test equipments require communication between them? Uh, no, I mean, they don't, uh, the test equipments don't communicate with each other. Uh, uh, they are only synchronized. Uh, you know, using the GPS timing signal so they can inject at the same time. It's only the relays that uh, that require communication between them because they are actually exchanging the information, right? So whatever the, the test equipment A and B on each end, they're injecting to the respective relays, they exchange that information on the communication uh, channel and, use, and they need the information from the opposite end. But with the test equipment, no, they don't communicate with each other. All right, um, over to Abel. What is the generalized alpha plane and how is it different from the alpha plane? Well, as the name implies, the generalized alpha plane is the generalization of the concept of the alpha plane to multiple uh, terminals. Uh, the, the, the thing with the alpha plane is that it uses the, uh, the ratio of the remote and the local currents uh, as you guys showed in the um, in the in the presentation, so it, it needs to use uh, two currents to provide uh, a point in the plane. And uh, here, and it, it, remember that, that the alpha plane is mapping three magnitudes. Basically, the magnitude of the uh, of of the current on the remote current, the local current, and the phase angle difference between them. It's mapping it into into a plane. But again, it needs two currents. So it's very well designed for when you have two terminals on the on the line differential. But when you have multiple terminals, 
such as when you have a breaker and a half configuration or multiple lines in the uh, or multiple a multi-terminal line in the in the scheme then uh, which current do you choose as your local and and your and your and your remote right so what they do in the um a generalized alpha plane is they uh generate a uh let's call it uh, uh, a, uh, a referential differ uh, local and differential remote current using uh, an algorithm that calculates those uh, those currents right in order to then map that multi-terminal uh, uh, system into the, uh, the, the 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 regular alpha plane that we have that remember uses only a local and remote so it basically produces a let's call it fake local and fake remote current and it produces those currents using a combination of all the different uh, terminals that we have it produces a uh, restraint and differential current and from those restraint and differential currents on the then it produces a uh, local and uh, and remote current and then it maps that into the the alpha plane that's how you uh that's what the generalized alpha plane is and, and it's basically again it's the uh, generalization of the concept of the alpha plane but for multi-terminal lines okay all right uh once more over to sugosh why do you call the line differential a protection scheme is it not a protection element okay um so uh, the reason, you know, I call the line differential as a protection scheme is that, uh, like I said before, it has more than one relay involved, right? Uh, there are relays at each end of the line if you're talking about double-ended system. And if you have more than one relay involved, there is communication involved. Uh, there's communication equipment, um, you know, and you have the uh, clocks for synchronization. There are multiple uh, interfaces present in that scheme. So, so. So there are a lot of different um, you know, uh, individual elements in there, right? So we call that as a scheme because there is uh, bad communication between the relays uh, and there is a, a characteristic that requires uh, both the relays to agree uh, on what they see on their respective ends. So, so we call that as a scheme. Uh, and and uh, I do understand why this question might have come up is that you know, if you are performing a, a pickup test, it's a single phase, uh, you know, on a particular phase on a single relay on one of the ends, you would just say I'm performing the 87L uh, element pickup test. But but once you get into the you know the the radius test and, and you know you're trying to perform a true internal fault test, you would you would be performing testing of the whole scheme rather than an individual relay. So that is why I call this as a prediction scheme and and not a prediction element. Thanks, Agosh. Uh, it looks like that's all we have for our Q&A session today. We apologize if we didn't get to your question live here today, but we will be working to follow up with you offline. Uh, as a reminder, a copy of this presentation, certificate of attendance, and a link to the video recording of this webinar will be emailed to everyone in about two business days. I'd like to thank you all for attending. If you could, please remember to answer our survey at the end of this webinar. That survey will include a field for you to request a quote or a demo if you're interested. But once again, I'd like to thank you all for attending and our panelists for joining in today. And I hope you all have a great week.